Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We have merged the streams here during election, bye week, Steelers week, autumnal pumpkin pie, and uh, the Taharka ice cream now with the cheesecake mixed together. It is fall here at the WNST, Baltimore Positive, and election week. And, you know, when I was a little boy, I, I campaigned against this guy, and then he became the election analyst. And we are so blessed to have him. And even though he has never invited me over for ramen to his place, they have him <laughs> safely sequestered in the sky above when Baltimore. When all this is over. When all this is you over. Can, you can see him out your window, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, can he can see, see the parks that he reigned over in East Baltimore and Patterson Park. <laughs> You're right. Ted, Ted Manitoulis is back. And, uh, you know, uh, back from the beach, back in time for election season. And, uh, you know, we had Nancy Pelosi on a couple of weeks ago and i know uh you you've been involved this is this is one of the crazier weeks and you're a little older than us ted that uh um you know i got a little butterfly some really weird weird emotions this week in a way that i can't say i did with any of the bushes or the ronald reagans yeah it uh this is an unusual election nestor we just have to uh come to grips with that it's very it's uh in many ways very mean uh it's very divisive um, and it's not, when I was in office, there was a lot of, we campaigned hard, but there was a lot of civility. We never attached names, of, uh, attacked people personally. We looked at their programs and their, uh, what they were doing and we revved it up, but, uh, this is really, very unusual, but we'll get over it. I mean, it'll, it'll get done and, and we'll get over it. With. Well, I thought that, uh, I, I, I saw David Pluff last night, of course, Obama's campaign manager now a consultant to msnbc and you know all around the country and they said well what do you advise people nestor they were talking about people all over the country having your malaise right now with these butterflies and so nervous and he said first of all don't look at the polls don't go to real clear politics average don't go to 538 just work as hard as you can that's for exactly the final right. week make as many calls get as many people to the polls. So it, Just it's, get it's out go- there and hustle and work. And uh, yeah. both parties should do that. But of course, I want uh, the Biden folks to do it. And they are, by the way. They oh, are, they're, work- they're working. They're working. My family's calling into Pennsylvania. Yep. Yeah, no, I've I got mean, my daughter makes calls several times a week. Uh, everyone's engaged. I got friends writing postcards. So the ground game has, has been impressive. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to have you back, Dad, and we'll have you back post-election to try to sort everything out but as you always do somehow Ted Venetoulos is always years ahead of the curve and in 1968 if I read it correctly is that right 1968 Ted Venetoulos wrote a book called The House Shall Choose it is still available (laughs) <laughs> at bookstores Amazon. and on Amazon at the big boy shops, as well as the little, the little shops that we try to support in the neighborhoods. The house shall choose. First of all, Ted, tell our listeners what in the heck the book was about. I think they're going to be shocked. And why in the hell you wrote the book in 1968? <laughs> well, I was working on a hill at the time. It was 1968. And as you may recall, George Wallace entered that race. And he was very, really had a hell of a shot. Very, very popular, popular in the South and popular in Maryland. Um, And it occurred to me, many people were starting to discuss the idea that if there are three candidates, Constitution says if none of the candidates, it's a majority of the electors, 270, I think it was 270 at the time, the election falls to the House of Representatives. And the House of Representatives chooses the president. The House shall choose. It's only happened twice in our history, and there were fascinating times, particularly the first, the first time was eight, in 1800, actually 1801, when Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr were tied. And um, it took Jefferson 35 ballots to beat Burr, and he beat him because Alexander Hamilton switched a Federalist vote from Burr to Jefferson. And that's what prompted the duel, by the way, between Jefferson and Burr that was so vividly described in the, in the play Hamilton. It was that particular incident. So in that incident, 35 ballots, the house had to keep balloting and balloting. And it was rough. I mean, names were flying and all, all that business. 
The second time wasn't as uh, poignant. It was 1824 when John Adams made a deal with Henry Clay. There were five candidates. Adams made a deal with Clay. Clay became Secretary of State. Adams became president and led to Andrew Jackson's election the next time because Jackson called it a corrupt bargain and campaigned on that and became the president in 1828. So the, the issue is whether that deadline or stalemate occurs this time. So let's talk about that for a moment. Could it? In, um, first, the electors meet, we vote on November the 3rd. The elector, we also vote for electors, as everybody knows. On November, on December the 14th, the electors meet in their individual capitals to cast their votes for the president. The president has to get 270. But first of all, those electors have to be certified by the states. Each state certifies its electors. Normally, there's not a problem they get certified. These electors do not have to vote for the person who carries their state. There's nothing, some states insist on that, but very few. And most of the time they do. There are some what we call faithless electors where they go off on their own and there have been a, but they don't, have not influenced an election. Once that happens, let's say there's no battle on a certification, although there is some Republican effort to make some noise on those on the certification and try not to certify them to delay or go to court or something. But let's assume they are certified. They send those certified electors to the Congress. On January 3rd, the new Congress is elected. Hey, Ted, I want to stop you just for a second sure. because I, I think our listeners now are really focusing in on this and they're trying to follow it. Let's take that first point you just made because my wife will ask me and she'll go, it makes no sense. Are you sure it's right? And it's this point about faithless electors. So before you jump to January 3rd, okay. on, on December the 14th, we know that Maryland is going to vote overwhelmingly for Joe Biden. Uh, right. Are you suggesting that on, on, that's on November the 3rd, on December the 14th, hypothetically, Maryland's 10 electoral college votes could say, nah, we're not doing that. We're going to vote for Donald Trump. Under the Constitution, you're saying they may do that? Yes, they could do that. They could do that. See, I don't um, think people know that, the Ted. That's never happened. Did you the know that, Nestor? Selector, or if one of those Maryland delegates said, I don't like Joe Biden, I'm going to write in Hillary Clinton or something like that. That's what has happened with the faithless electors. But so no group has. But in some of the states where it's close, if it's a, let's, a Republican, let's say it's a Republican legislature and a Republican governor, they could play games with the electors. Let's say the Democrats won the popular vote. The, the General Assembly and the governor control the certification of those electors, and they could throw them out and say, look, there was fraud. We're throwing those electors out. We're certifying this batch of electors, and they send those to Washington. And then they vote. Now, there'll probably be lawsuits and everything. And because Republicans have been drumming this up, I have to say that Nancy and the Democrats are prepared for that. Uh, in case anything like that happens, quite frankly, there's some things that they can do. But let's get it to January the 3rd. So that, I hope, explains the faithless elector. Just problem. real quick before you do that, Nestor, were you aware that electors did not have to cast their vote. For I have the read and seen those. Yes. I mean, I follow the media and Twitter and more modern things. Yes. And I, I would wonder how that would go over in said state. Um, some states, by the way, Nestor, some states do uh, have uh, legislate that those electors have to support the winner of the election. A couple states have proportionate breakdown. If you win, you don't get all of the votes. You get that congressional district or something like that. But when you do that, you lose your power. The power in the states is to deliver their entire delegation to a single person. Well, then and you so literally become a rogue state, right? Literally. You can be a rogue state. We call them a faithless elect, but it's a rogue state. You could, right. but it hasn't happened. And so it now happened we're on Congress. January 3rd, Ted. So right, now January we're to January 3rd, 3rd. The new Congress is sworn in. And that's important because on January the 6th, 
the Congress meets to ratify the electors. Okay, because the Congress now have to rat ratify these guys. And now if both the Senate and the House do not ratify, let's say they don't ratify Maryland's electors, if let's say the House doesn't ratify, but the Senate does, well, then there's a battle over that. There can be a fight. Now there has not been. Normally they make their deals, they ratify the electors, and then where the fun begins. If nobody gets 270 electors, a majority of the electors, then it falls to the House of Representatives to choose a president. And that's where the House shall choose. Now, the House picks a, uh, the, the uh, president, the Senate in the meantime picks the vice president. The Senate votes individually, you need 51 votes. The House, however, votes by states. Every state has one vote. California, with 53 members of the House delegation, cast one vote. Wyoming, with one member of their delegation, cast one vote. Now, Fred, say, Ted, I love the founding fathers. I yeah. love the founding. I love Hamilton yeah. and Madison. <laughs> this isn't working Jefferson. anymore. What well, in, in the world behind. were they thinking? No, they had, they had a reason for it. They did not want they did not want a, a, the mob to pick a demagogue. Does that sound familiar? And they had a cooling process. People would vote for, by the way, at that time, legislature. The legislature would pick the electors. The electors would then pick the president. Each step of the way gave everybody a chance to see if they did the right thing. Checks and balances? Is that the worst word for it? It's part of the balance. It, sure. it, our balance is between the three branches. But this is a cooling process uh, 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 during an election. So the electors were supposed to be, by the way, very independent. They were supposed to be the wisest people in our country. And they were supposed ultimately to pass on what the, what the public did. Okay, so now, and, and by the way, the, the, they, they thought that the, the House, which is the people's body, should make that choice when it gets, when it's stalemated. That's why they picked the House. They also did it one vote at a time because they had to compromise with the, with the Senate, with the Southern states and the New England states, and they had to make a compromise. So it wasn't something they did just, okay, let's do it this way. They thought it through. Had a lot of battles and debate over it. Let, let's reset. Uh, Uncle Ted's here. Ted Vanatoulis uh, joining us uh, from my neighborhood without ramen, but at some point, <laughs> sushi's going to be involved. I learned how to eat with chopsticks. Uh, Don Bowler's here, former Baltimore County Executive. Uh, all of it brought to you by our friends at the State Fair and El Guapo and Fadley's and Moeller and Gary and Taharka and all of these wonderful Baltimore things. Ted, I want to ask you as the senior guy here and, and where we are with states and federal. You know, anytime we talk about how we're going to get um, the, anything back in this country on the backside of the masks and COVID, it's going to be federal help and where we are. And, you know, my dad always talked about the New Deal and FDR. We hear about AOC and wherever all of this is going to go. But from the states and the federal, the, 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 the friction, what we see happen with Gretchen uh, Whitmer in, in Michigan, where, I mean, one point you ran for the governor of our state. Can you imagine the, the president of the United States not backing a governor after an attempted kidnapping and coup. I mean, we're in a different place here with this guy as far yeah. as how the states view themselves and how they've been viewed with simple help during a plague as to whether they shine the shoes of the president. I, we've never seen this. And I think part of it is because the president never had any experience in politics, he never ran for office before this, never had to deal, deal with general assemblies or governors, did not understand the way the, the Constitution was set up and the balance between the states and the federal government and the requirement of the federal government to intrude itself on the national issues. When there's a hurricane, we send federal help. If there's a any kind of catastrophe, a flood of that nature, the fires in the West Coast, we send federal help. And that's part of the system. We don't send troops. That's a different thing. The, the Constitution, the framers did not want the national government to have the power to intrude on the states because they wanted to protect itself from military engagement. They do if a governor calls for it or if there's some kind of a, a real reason for that happening. But in any event, let's take it that's 
that's that's not right what's going on today and it'll, it'll be squared out because the country has a lot of resilience and we'll get back to that reasonable relationship in the meantime we get to the house of representatives okay no one has 270 the house meets and it starts to vote and the winner has to get 26 states they have to give a majority of the states today it's 26. if this current House of Representatives voted, the Republicans, even though they don't have a majority of the House, do have 26 states. So the Republicans could pick the president if the election took place today with this House. For the Democrats, fortunately, it'll be the next House of Representatives, the one that gets sworn in on January the 3rd, that will pick the president. And that uh, breakdown may be, may be different. Let's say Biden wins, the Democrats control the House, they'll probably designate, uh, uh, designate Biden and the Senate with 51 votes. If they wanted to, they could, if they don't, the Democrats don't get a majority there, they could pick, uh, they could pick Pence uh, if they wanted to. Ha you know, that has not happened because this hasn't happened that often, but they don't have to pick the Democrat. That's one reason why the Democrats are fighting so hard to win the Senate as well as the House in case it does go to the House of Representatives. But let me also say this, if there's any skullduggery that will go on in the House of Representatives when they vote, Nancy is ready for that as well. So she's just, not, if Biden wins the election and it's stalemated, uh, there's gonna be a hell of a battle in the, in the House of Representatives, uh, depending on, on that makeup. Now, let me take it one step, because you guys will, will like this. If the House can't come to grips with somebody, if they can't get 26 votes, as happened with Jefferson and Burr, where it went 35 ballots, the House has to keep voting. If no one gets 26 votes, and let's say the Senate is stalemated, and they can't pick somebody, they need a quorum and all that business on the Senate, the acting president becomes Nancy Pelosi. The Senate hasn't picked a, a, a vice president. If the Senate does pick a vice president, that person becomes acting president until the House settles on the president. If the House doesn't Senate settle and the Senate doesn't settle, the third in line or the second in line, Nancy, becomes acting president. It's a crazy system, but we could get our own local gal president of the United <laughs> States if it gets double stalemated or double deadlocked. Which How does the Venetulis book in 1968, <laughs> well, the House shall choose? Speaker. How does it end? Give us, oh, give us, give us the book. spoiler. This is a spoiler alert. How does it end? Well, I have an epilogue to the book. And the epilogue is the battle between Wallace, Humphrey, and um, who was the opponent to Humphrey? Was it Nixon? Who was the Republican opponent that Six, year? Yeah, it, was Nixon. it was Nixon. Yeah, Richard Nixon. Humphrey, Nixon, and uh, George, and, um, George Wallace won thirteen Wallace. states. George, and I have, George Wallace I have won thirteen Nixon. states. Ted, what? George Wallace won thirteen states. He did. He won thirteen. Oh no, no, he had a right. shot. Oh, this was not something ephemeral. This he had a shot, and so the epilogue takes it through, through, and uh, and then we have you know Humphrey winning the election or whatever, but. Um, Anyhow, so that's, that's the major stalemate that could happen. There are other stalemates. The president dies. Let's say before the votes are counted, one of the candidates passes away, dies. It's a great book by Jeff Greenfeld called The People's Choice, where the where a president of one of the parties the schedulers insisted he go to some state and ride a horse because they couldn't, they had to cancel it during the campaign. And they pro promised the cowboys out there, Wyoming or Montana, <laughs> that they would send them out to a rodeo. Well, the guy's never ridden a horse, but he has to go on the horse because that was the whole deal. And a veterinarian injects the horse mistakenly with some high power thing. The horse jumps up, the president elect falls over, goes over, and he's dead. He's gone. <laughs> And now, who, who is the president? The uh, electors haven't voted yet. The election's over, this guy has won, but the electors haven't voted. Who do they vote for? You can't put somebody on the ballot, it's too late. So 
in this instance, the question is complicated, but it's an interesting book and it tells you a lot about well, that. I, I hope we, I, we, don't, we don't know how to handle that, by the way. There is a system. The party recommends somebody. The Republican Party would recommend somebody for Trump. The electors would have the choice of picking him or elevating their vice president if they chose. Now, suppose the president dies, I don't know, after the Congress meets. We're not sure of, well, if that takes place, then the acting president will become president. So that's reasonably taken care of. But it's very tricky when you have these kind of lapses or episodes that occur in our system. The, the, there will be many folks opining about this on the evening of November 3rd. We have <laughs> scooped them all, and we've beaten them to the punch, as we do here on Baltimore. You know, Baltimore. all of this made me wonder, as I'm sitting here with two uh, former Baltimore County executives, <laughs> that when Kevin Kamenitz passed, you, you, you break, like, I still don't really know how Moeller became county executive. I don't really <laughs> know, <laughs> you know? Was yeah, it was. You know, council picks the president. Absolutely, and they pick the best man. They picked on. Well, thank you for that. But I, I can remember Nestor at six a.m. on that awful morning, um, of uh, the morning after, all the press was there, and that was their first question. And again, the the first county question is charter, who's running the county? Is that literally? Well, yes. What okay. happens now? And the county charter was was crystal clear that. Yeah. In the interim, the county administrative officer, right. uh, who at that time was a gentleman named Fred Homan, right. runs the county until the county council decides who they want yeah. to complete but the do, term. Does so, every county and, and municipality, they, they have to have a, something I think for most this, of right? Them do. Yeah. I think most of them do have the council. Don't you, Don? Uh, pick, I do. Pick, okay. Pick the, uh, executive. Yeah, I think most of them. And, and the administrative officer serves in the interim until that until they meet and do that it's a but, good but system your, but your question is a good one nestor people wanted to know you know is there snow going to continue to be cleared is there trash going to be picked up are we going to continue to meet payroll and the answer was all of that will happen the administrative officer is in charge until the council decides who they would like to complete in this case in this tragic case yeah. the, final, very, the final the final seven months system. We have a simple continuity system. I think it works. Yeah. And, it, well, and it worked quite well. And it's well. going to be put to the test here, right? I mean, I think that's the reason we're even talking about any of this is that we feel like with this guy, with the ethics of this guy, with the words that have been spoken, uh, that things are in the balance here that have never been questioned before as yeah. to – what happens next week at 11 o'clock on right. Tuesday? Nestor, you're exactly. This is the first time we have had a president or a candidate who won, who attacks the voting system, calls it fraudulent. We've never had a president do that because we really have very, very little fraud that has taken place. But that's the first time. It's the first time that we have had a, a candidate say they may not follow the normal transition when they lose. Even Al Gore, who had real reason to hang in and not accept the Supreme Court's decision because it really was a rocky decision, um, said right off the bat, he will follow, he will, he will help the new pr president-elect get oriented. Donald Ted, Trump hasn't said that. Ted, I, I, I always one point of the things back. That, Go ahead. One of, the, I'm sorry. one of the things that offends me about many members of the Republican Party, which I think has been a great party, that they don't catch him on that and say, wait a minute. Continuity has been the essence of our democracy. We go from one president to another without machine guns in the marketplace. But and he is a human being that has demanded fealty at every level. And that's, that's what we're seeing 30, you know, 43 months, 44 months into this, right? Well, and, and to be fair, Ted uses the Gore example. To be fair to our friends on the Republican side of the aisle, you can go back to 1960 when, you know, there were multiple reports that perhaps Mayor Daley in Cook County yeah. in Illinois held the votes till he figured out exactly how many Jack Kennedy needed to win <laughs> that state. And there were numerous Nixon advisors who encouraged him to challenge the vote in Cook County to drag it out. And Nixon famously said, I'm not going to put the country through that. We are 
we, 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 we pride ourselves on a peaceful transition of power. So, Ted, be, be, before we let you... And I'm glad it, you raised that, Don, and then come back, because it does show that uh, uh, candidates of both parties have honored the continuity system. Go ahead. Ab abs with, with, without a doubt, without a doubt. Ted, before we let you run, and as I said, we really do look forward to you coming back on post-election. Well, I'll give you my prediction before it's all. Yeah, well, I want here. that. I'm going to get that at the end. Before we ask you for your prediction, what you're, you're a writer, I always say. You're, you're, you're really an outstanding writer. Uh, you, you're, you're a county executive elected official and a publisher, but I think in your heart, like Nestor, you have a writer's heart. Yeah, I, when think you, the, I think you're right about that. No, no, you guys have I've writer's accepted hearts. it at 52. Yeah. <laughs> when you sit down post-election, and I, and I hope you will write extensively about this, Without rancor, without anger, remove Trump from the picture for a minute and try to analyze Trumpism. Okay. What is it? Forget Donald Trump, the reality star. But what is it? We talked with Josh Kurtz a little while ago. What is it that allows millions of people to watch an incredibly polite and courteous Leslie Stahl? And because the president tells them she was a bitch, quote unquote, and awful and nasty and mean, they say, my God, she was mean and nasty. And you watch it. And she was like your first grade <laughs> teacher, right? I mean, yeah. she or your yeah. Sunday school teacher. She couldn't have been more polite. What? Can you imagine him in, in a negotiation with Putin or something? Uh, um, if he thought amazing. she was rough. But, but how, how, what are you, what are your initial thoughts, Ted? Well, my, uh, about my, analyzing this, what happened to allow Trumpism, not Trump, yeah. Trumpism. Well, it's always pained me, and I often sit down and think, well, am I wrong? Because there's apparently 35% of the public that has a certain adoration for this fellow. It's a cult. It isn't a base. It's a cult. Uh, they they uh, condone him on Fifth Avenue shooting someone. I mean, I believe that. Uh, he is... You know, think of it. He's called John McCain a coward. He's uh, allowed, he's called men of our forces, military losers, suckers. He's a uh, demeaned woman. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't get it. He's diminished the plague that's, in the well, middle that's of my, the plague. That, and that's my that, challenge, that, Nestor. Ned, Ted, we're not going to pin you down well, today. Okay. My challenge to you over the next few weeks is to try to put pen and paper and to make some sense out of it, that because we'll, we're going to have to go forward either way. Yeah, we're yeah. going to have to go forward if he wins. We're going to have to go forward if he loses, and we have to figure out what it is. As you said, I'm in exactly the same place you are. I, I want to be able to have a better discussion with my friends and relatives. Right, going forward. I mean. I mean, there's close no relatives. Now. They get, get still I, eat it. Yeah. I can't. I, I don't know how to have yeah. it because yeah. we don't see things the same way. Yeah. All right, we're getting ready to wrap it up, okay. Ted. Here we go. November 3rd, days <laughs> away. Ladies and gentlemen, you're hearing it right from the horse's <laughs> mouth. As Nestor calls him, Uncle Ted is going to tell us where this election is coming out. All right. I hate to say this because it makes me nervous and I really, I, I don't, it's too. Optim Eddie, I think Biden's going to win in a landslide. I think he's going to get over 300 electors, and I think he's going to get 57% of the vote. Now, I hope my optimism doesn't jinx it, but I really sense that the country is fed up with what we have seen over the last four years. And um, when you look at all the Republicans who have been flailing away, the Lincoln Brigade, the anti-Trump Brigade, all the members of the administration who are jumping off, jumping off the ship, um, and unfortunately, they deserve it because of the Republican Senate. If they would have stood up and talked to him and said, look, some of this stuff, you just can't do it. Cut it out. If they'd have cautioned him, if they'd have talked to him, we wouldn't be in this mess, I don't think. And they would have a shot at reelecting him. But they didn't do that. They, That's they true. You've heard it. You've heard it. It's a blue wave, according to Ted Venetoulis. <laughs> Mark that on your calendar. We're going to come back and see if he was correct. Ted, I don't know if it's going to be ramen or meatballs or, you know, I don't know, some, some eggs and bags, something. But you and I are going to get together at some point. We will. 
neighbors. Okay. All right? right after this is all over, when my gang lets me out. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, but we'll, we'll, we'll get the key for you. Ted Venatoulis, uh, former Baltimore County executive, Tassel Times publisher, and, uh, of course, man around our town of Baltimore, as well as uh, former Baltimore County executive Don Moeller, my high school guidance counselor, getting <laughs> wisdom and getting civics courses here. We are at WNST.net, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. Keep it up, guys. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. We Ted. never stop talking Baltimore positive. <laughs>